Trevilian Next is a division of Trevilian, a financial services specialist search and talent advisory firm. Since inception, the Trevilian team has dedicated itself to enhancing the return on investment of a company's most important resource, its people. Well, hello, everyone. This is Brian Love, head of banking and fintech at Trevilian. And I'm joined today with Sarah Howell, SVP Partner Programs at Infinite. Hello, Sarah. How are you? Hi, Brian. Great to great to be here. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. You're in uh, sunny uh, Tampa, Florida, and I'm in freezing cold Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, <laughs> I can actually feel the heat emanating from the screen. Um, <laughs> So I uh, obviously we got to know each other a little earlier this year, and then we actually uh, encountered one another at the FedFist Roundup in Fredericksburg. Yeah. So a quick shout out to the to the Mayos and to the um, uh, the FedFist guys for bringing right. a bunch of great people together. Yes. Um, maybe you'd like to introduce yourself a little more fully to our viewers. Yeah. So uh, great to be here. Like I said earlier, Sarah Howell. Um, Come from from more of a payments background. Stumbled into Baz through seeing you know some prepaid um, kind of m business models early on back in the day. That's one of the good things about being older in this industry is you get to see trends. And so <laughs> some of those trends have evolved, and now there's the sexy name of Baz or Embedded Finance. But um, so I got to see some of that evolve. Uh, and currently at Infinite, uh, very grateful to be working with uh, the Infinite crew on um, building out a platform that enables both embedded finance and embedded fintech. So that's awesome. Yeah. By the way, old in the bass space is three years, right? <laughs> you know, so it's like nobody's really been doing it. The, the resumes we see at Trevilian, it's like if they have three years of payments, it's like, wow, they know everything. Um, Good point. Yeah. But thank you for, you know, your background's terrific. Um, you know, I know you were, you're at Visa and some other places and, and that's just, you know, a phenomenal. But I really wanted to hear a little bit more about your current role. And what excites me so much is that we have banks reach out to us and they say, hey, we are considering Bass as an option. There's not a week that goes by that it doesn't come up with a more traditional bank thinking about deposit growth, thinking about fee revenue and how to you know, optimize that in a rising rate environment. So generally, there's one of two ways you could go, but Infinite kind of represents a third way. And the first way is you know, build it yourself. That's a huge lift, very expensive, may take you three years less, who knows, somewhere in that vicinity. Second is reaching, you know, reaching out to a middleware company like a lot of the Bass Banks have done, and that works extremely well. Mm -hmm. But what excited me about you, Sarah, you can tell me a little bit more about Infinite is how they represent that kind of third category and, and the benefits to that. Sure, sure. Well, um, I think um, if you're if you think about banking as a service as the how, it's <laughs> and the embedded finance as the what, right? Embedded finance is putting banking products into a, another software solution at a customer's point of need. And that is embedded finance is the what. And then banking as a service is the how. And to your point, there are three different ways to go to market for BAS. You can build it yourself, but then you, not only are you you know, is that a heavy tech lift? It's also a heavy talent lift and a new operation and model, you know, and, and business model that you're that you're evolving into all at once. Definitely think that the Baz API marketplace providers, whatever you want to call them, you know, Baz connectors, um, bring a lot of value to the market. Those platforms, in my opinion, were built for um, for the fintech or for the neo banks in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily for the banks in mind. And what differentiates Infinite and what excited me about Infinite <laughs> was that Infinite was built by um, folks that used to do digital banking and understood banking and have always traditionally built for banks. And so Infinite's um, platform is purpose-built for banks. Uh, so I had some fintech friends in the industry that gave me a hard time for, for joining a Baz, um, you know, <laughs> platform. And I just said, no, these guys are different. And that's why. Oh, that's awesome. And I wonder, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, as you start to engage with a, you know, a client, mm -hmm. um, you know, what are you hearing out there from your clients in terms of, you know, what makes them nervous about bass, about getting into this embedded space? How are you able to help them overcome some of these hurdles? 
Oh, that's a good question. I spoke to a bank yesterday that's doing a little bit in Baz already. And they were like, are you guys going to help us with our your strategy? I was like, we don't have a, with our strategy. I was like, we don't have a product for it, but you know, you get us, right? You get our, our thoughts um, and, and the way that we view the market. Um, some of the, I think, things that are, are concerning is that sometimes it's not just an organizational change that banks are going through. It's one thing to bring an organization through change. Um, it's another thing to bring an organization through change amid so much macro change happening in our environment. And if you think about the broader macro changes and evolving into a new BAS strategy amid those, like I keep those very, I keep an eye on everything that's evolving. We've got new payment rails evolving with RTP and Fed now. That impacts BAS and potential revenue streams, right? Um, we have new CBDCs and fiat, like new forms of money evolving. That will also impact, you know, what, what my BAS strategy looks like. And then we also have what I like to call digital um, supply chain disruption, where um, if you look at how digital supply chains were impacted in other industries like uh, entertainment and music and um, telecom, uh, those the last mile delivery for those products was disrupted. That's why I can use Roku now to see, you know, <laughs> all of my different, um, you know, shows that I want to watch across Prime or across yep. Netflix or, or my cable provider, um, any of those. That is last mile supply chain disruption. And if you think about it, it, embedded finance is the embodiment of that happening in our industry. So, I don't think that embedded finance in BAS is going away. I feel like it's something that every bank will have to have a strategy where they own the in, the last customer engagement, you know, that last um, mile delivery of their products to their customers. That's that's the whole beauty of a community bank, right? Yeah. And then they'll also have to have a, a you know a strategy where they don't own last mile delivery, but they own the product <laughs> in the first model. The bank is a services and product org. And the last model, the bank is a product org. And so making those types of transitions internally are, are difficult. Um yeah. I don't I don't say it's easy at all. So I I encourage banks whenever they are first pivoting into BAS, talk to a BAS API provider. It's good. It's good for your organization. Think about working with them, the the you know, the units, the Treasury Prime, the Sinctera. Um let it be a part of your strategy because it helps you adapt to the organizational changes, the sales motion changes that you're going to have to have in a, uh, the compliance <laughs> aspect. It teaches you so much, um, but pay very much attention to the macro trends that are occurring because that model may not always be the best model for, for your financial institution. Sure. Yeah, my children will never, you know, have to deal with a blockbuster video. And, you know, they, <laughs> they just hit a button and they're watching, you know, uh, their shows. But, um, you know, I was thinking um, also it's, you know, you could reach out to banks that have done BAS successfully. There right. are a few banks like Coastal Community Bank and right. Lincoln Savings right. Bank, both very right. good friends of Trevelyan's. And it seems like this community is very wide open to talk through, um, you know, how to do things best because, you know, there's some regulatory pressures and burdens um, mm -hmm. that are popping up this year for sure. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, if you're, again, you're talking to a client, what, what advice do you have on the risk side? And then further, Sarah, we talked about talent a little. I want to get into that a little bit more of what talent needs to be there as infinite or whatever provider you deal with, you know, helps you get into this space. Who needs to be at the bank? Great, great, great point. Let me circle back to the talent question. A lot and there, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Um, but and as far as your as your first question, um, I I feel like we evolved here, right? We mm -hmm. got to this because if you think about Baz, the Baz business model with the FBO settlement is really a new and shiny form of prepaid <laughs> card issuance. And, and that's where I go back to, you know, being in this industry a long time. I mean, our first real prepaid card was, was you know, Green Dot, who back in 1998 was using TESA's stored value platform and Synovus as a, as a bin sponsor. So this is back way before Bass was ever sexy. How do you do that? How do you manage a customer that's embedding financial products 
when you don't own the relationship with the technology provider, you do it by FBO. <laughs> They're not sitting on your system of record. You enforce some compliance across the ecosystem, but you, you don't own that virtual ledger where all that customer data is. You have to figure out new ways and data, you know, create a data warehouse and data file um, pulls and, and dumps every day, right? To try and get that customer information in. Um, you you mentioned the regulatory scrutiny. That that's what's scary, right? That's what scares the regulators is that the bank is responsible for an end customer that they don't own the technology for, whose information exists on a technology stack that they don't own. Because what happens in Baz, and, and I did this whenever I was at Visa, I would I would get a fintech and they would say, I want to I want to manage my own platform. Um, I'm going to go out and model a deal with a charter bank, and then I'm going to model a deal with a technology provider. And in that instance, who does a technology provider listen to? They listen to their customer. And yeah. so it makes for a very um, difficult model from to enforce regulation across you know, that tri-party type of relationship. It's doable, but I think that's what's causing a lot of regulatory scrutiny. Yeah, I agree. And, and as we you know, I mentioned the talent piece, I think the way I answer that with our clients and potential clients around embedded banking is to really make sure you've got the right risk components in place first. Mm -hmm. Every bank most likely has a head of risk, a chief risk officer, something to that effect. But is that person also innovative? Does that person also understand FBO accounts? Does that person understand payment rails and, and all of those different nuances there? Mm -hmm. So it's always our communication is before you even get into this, make sure there's a nucleus of mm -hmm. innovative risk talent. Mm -hmm. It sounds like maybe that's an oxymoron of some sort, and I don't mean to offend any <laughs> risk managers, but that's what we tell folks. Do you agree with that? Or you know, what, what's your take on who to be, who needs to be in what seats? Completely. And I think, um, I think having folks that have grown up in the industry makes it a little bit easier, but you want to find smart creatives, people that are able to... Um, uh, see a business need and meet, figure out a way to make technology meet that need. And um, I think the, the more you can have things automated and technology meeting that need, the, the greater um, it reduces your, your risk or it mitigates your risk. Um, but yes, as far as the type of talent to recruit, I, I do like those banks that form a separate entity. It doesn't have to be, you know, completely different entity. It can just be a different business unit. Um, because what it does is it creates an opportunity for the folks that join that business unit to think differently about banking. And sure. you do need that in, in BAS. You need them to be able to think differently about banking. One of, one of the questions that we got at the FedFiz is like, who do you look for for talent when you're, when you're you know, in, in BAS? And I was like, you want to look for the people that can identify the embedded flows. So um, one of the things that that I would do at Visa was that I would have a platform come to me. Um, I had a really great fintech um, that came to me and they were in the house flipping space. So they were creating an operating system or pro project management system for, for home flippers. These guys were, you know, if you're flipping a house, a lot of times you're doing it as a side hustle, but they would help them, um, you know, purchase the home initially, then they would create a project plan, then they would provide some funding for the construction loan. Um, and then whenever things started happening uh, with COVID, they recognized a different opportunity. And that was that you had a lot of these institutional investors that were looking to buy these homes. So then they created, you know, they, they use their platform with all their house flippers um, to create a supply chain for those institutional investors. So, I mean, they were just so creative and, uh, and what I would try and do is like, okay, well, that's a payment flow, or that is a, that's a lending opportunity for a bank to come in and insert some type of a, you know, a construction loan, whether that's 50, 50 K or more or whatever. Um, so you want somebody in that's able to look at different industries and the software that they are standing up and find uh, financial flows. That's awesome. I wrote that. I identify the embedded flows. And then mm -hmm. just the term smart creatives, we've used that occasionally, but I like that. That's a, a very easy way to, to put it. And that's kind of who we're, we're out there um, 
um, recruiting, you know, recruiting, right? <laughs> yep. No, yep. I, I, I did want to mention because it's all over every news uh, channel. Um, the layoffs in the space from MX to big, you know, firms like Amazon and Facebook. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, obviously, I don't know if you have any any thoughts on how banks kind of seize the opportunity here. Mm-hmm. We were talking earlier, mm-hmm. pardon me, about how the culture of a bank could be fantastic or very off putting. If you're going after tech talent, any other, any, I'd love to hear some of those thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we were talking earlier about um, when I was at Visa, I talked to a, a group of leaders um, about uh, if you, if you think about some of the FinTech leaders in the industry, um, some, some of the guys that I worked with, the CEOs, the FinTechs that I worked with, they were ex bankers and, and I kind of discussed to some of the leadership at, at Visa was that like, the why did they leave? Why did they leave the banking industry? And, you know, my, my thesis is that organizations organize and highly regulated organizations like banks and, you know, big networks, card networks or processors um, that have been in the business for a long time, they organize even more. And so there's tight regulatory constraints and it makes it very hard for somebody that's very creative to affect change in those types of organizations. And so I feel so. So what happened was those those people, they left and they started their own fintech companies and they began to affect change from outside the organization and disrupt the industry as a whole. And so I think that things are kind of coming full circle now with some of the layoffs, which are heartbreaking, but I do feel like it's an opportunity for banks and, you know, um, those those larger companies that had more of an organizational structure to, to recruit some really good talent, but recognize why that talent left in the first place and make sure that you're giving them a voice. Don't put them in a box. Let them wear a lot of hats because if they've been in a fintech, they're used to wearing a lot of hats. Okay. Yeah. Give them a variety of projects so that they can identify connections across products or customer needs. Because the more um, seemingly unrelated tasks that they have, Smart creatives can create connections and see connections before other people. So give them or let them explore other areas of the organization because it will it will allow them to connect those dots. Um, and then even ask them to identify some efficiency gains across your direct business unit as a bank. So, you know, the when you own last mile delivery and you own those customers, let them see what, what are we doing? How how could we how could we improve that? as well as the BAS business, right? Because you're going to probably keep them in this little BAS business org um, and and let them, um, you know, affect change there, but also bring them in and allow them to connect dots for the direct business side. And then just listen to their ideas. You don't have to implement every single one of them, but just listening um, will earn respect and respect will go a long way in employee retention. Yeah, and, and this industry... You know, I guess over time it's kind of been played with some egos. I mean, it's natural in almost every industry, but yes. you know, kind of suppressing that and empowering these types of talents, you know, to help uh, affect change is so crucial to the relevancy of banks, community banks over the decades to come. So I love the point that you just made, and I've made it too, yeah. is that when someone like this can come in, you know, allow them to look at your entire tech stack, your entire, you know, operational flow. Mm-hmm. And there may be some great ideas, like you said, with, you know, with efficiencies, robotics, automation, et cetera, mm-hmm. that someone else in the organization may not be able to see. Right. These folks can get bored easily uh, when we, when we, when we, when we plug them into certain organizations. So they need to have, you know, a bigger vision than just, you know, Hey, build out my bass division. Right. Right. So I, I totally agree. Very well stated. Um, I wanted to ask you, Sarah, uh, who are some of the banks, you know, the players? Where do you get your ideas and thought leadership from? You know, th- those players that are exciting to you. Um, I- I'll be very honest. I look a lot at what happens in other regions and other countries um, because 
you know, I, I think that a lot, especially happening in the EU with open banking, even though their regulatory bodies created some requirements and some guardrails that fostered greater adoption of open banking. I mean, open banking still exists in the U.S. because we're a free market economy and it just flows over. It just takes longer for us to do it because, you know, we live in a free country, which is great. I love that. Um, and our regulators are a little bit more hesitant to to create those types of, of structures. Um, but that doesn't mean that customers don't get accustomed to some of those things and that drives adoption just from a a market perspective. So I look a lot at about what's happening in the EU, what's happening in other countries relative to CBDC, um, the new payment rails that are being created, um, as well as what are some of the new products? What are some of the open banking APIs that banks are standing up in the EU? Because that's one of the opportunities that Infinite's platform provides is it allows the bank to have their own dev portal, create their own products, um, be a little bit more core above the core so you can be core agnostic um, and put the different partners that you want to have and then say, okay, here's one API for your loan origination. <laughs> and so that you build in the, you know, kind of the compliance and um, the technology all into that one API. So I see that happening a lot in the EU already. And so that informs kind of some of my strategic thinking here for the US market. Yeah, you feel like the U.S. has 8,000 financial institutions, probably more than that. Mm -hmm. And that must stifle our innovation ridiculously, right? That's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it does. On that note, Sarah, I thank you so much for your time and your thoughts about the space. Um, very fascinating to talk to you. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it um, and uh, appreciate all you guys are doing to um, help us and, and all of this in the financial services space and all, all these crazy changes that are occurring in our industry. Fun times, yeah. right? Fun times indeed. Well, thank you. Thanks.